I'm saying is there's a problem in this part of the world, Nigeria. And you don't hear me? Yeah. You don't understand me? Yeah, I, I I, I heard what you said, but I disagree with that. that there's no problem. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm talking about Christianity. So, we inherited some things from the Western world. That is wearing of trousers to, to uh, women wearing of trousers. That women have to wear trousers? That women are wearing trousers. Okay. And uh, the the people who went to who say they went to hell and went to heaven. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Now that's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. That people say women who wear trousers will go to hell. I mean, this is superficial. The Bible never said that. You notice when I say he will go to hell, and the people who don't have the real faith in God, they don't repent, who don't turn away from God, and to, who don't obey God, and who don't have a good relationship with God, and who don't serve God. But we're not saved by doing good. We're saved by trusting in Jesus as our Savior. So we're saved by grace through faith. But when we're saved, we have good works. But the good works doesn't include wearing dresses. That has nothing to do with the relationship with Jesus. It's just a custom of some people. The women go to church like to wear dresses, but it doesn't matter. We have to discern. We have to discern what is the important thing. What is the important thing? The important thing is to trust in God, repent, and obey Him and serve Him. These are the important things, right? So, so in, in Nigeria or in Africa, we believe that the Bible says that women should not wear the things meant for men. No, uh, yeah, yeah. Or the clothing for men. Exactly. Well, yeah. well, well, okay, listen, listen, please quiet down. Please quiet down. That there are many women in the world, they're wearing trousers. Trousers are not necessarily restricted to men. I mean, it's a definition, a human definition by external thing to say trousers only belong to men and women have to wear dresses. All over the world, even in America, the many women wear trousers. It doesn't have to be dress. It's, this is superficial. Now, what is definition? What is men's clothing? Because some women want to dress totally like a man. That's what the Bible speaks against. Or a man dressed like a woman. Please quiet down. Okay. So we have to discern what does the Bible say. Not to put it. This culture came from the West. But at that time, the women wear dresses in the West. And but this culture stayed in Africa. And then people think they have to wear dresses. I'm saying this is unnecessary and we can, for a culture we never condemn people to hell because of culture. We can never condemn someone to hell because of culture. The Bible only says this thing, what is important, those things, the relationship with God that affects the relationship whether the person will hell or not. Okay? So, the Western culture has changed because in those days in the past, the women all dress in dresses, but it's changed already. It's, this is changed with time. So I'm just saying, it, this is not an important issue. Put, put our eyes on important issues, not on unimportant things. Wait, 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 listen. If people just look at culture and don't look at the most important thing in Christian life, they lose the point of the message in the Bible. The point in the Bible is to love and obey God and serve Him. That's the most important thing in the Bible, not the external thing. Okay. My question is about raising people to serve God. Now, in the church, we are the pastor is only interested in music. Talking about music doesn't allow people to display the ministerial gift in them. How do we correct this impression? 
so that we can reach people to serve God. Yeah, the of such is uh, interested in music, the music, the music, that's the music, that's singing, singing, singing. I saw pastors and music, okay, music. The pastors are not interested in, in raising people, but they are only interested in music. They only, yeah. Okay. Now, the pastor is responsible to God. How the pastor leads the church, the church will become like him. If the pastor, you know, just look at music, or just look at external things, and don't look at the inner quality of the life of people and serving God, the church will not go that direction. So the pastor himself is the most important person. That's why I come to Africa or anywhere. I encourage, firstly, I want to train pastors and leaders so that they are leading the people to follow what the Bible says. Everything I'm taught is from the Bible. It's what is important in the Bible, the great commandment and the great commission. These are the important thing in the Bible. And everything else build up the great commandment and great commission. So if the pastor just pay attention to music, what happens is just become a music church, a music group. And people, if they don't follow God, don't love God, music doesn't make big, big, uh, great Christians. We want to have a balance of the teaching. Now, music is important. If you use music to praise God, now that's why I, when I observe, when I came to Africa, I observe people who dance or sing to the music. Now, there are people who are really praising God, but there are people just looking at the steps. And just yeah. you know, just is paying attention to the step. And <laughs> Jesus doesn't look at the steps. But when people are excited about Jesus, Hallelujah, God is good. The people like Jesus and follow Jesus. That's a good thing. So the music should draw people to follow God, not to follow music steps. Yes. And so the training for the music leaders is always saying, hey, when you lead worship, don't just don't just sing, but you also use prayer. Pray and sing together. So when you pray, it's like this. Let us worship God together with all our heart and love God and appreciate Him for everything. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All this time is showing the gratitude and the love for God. This is true worship. True worship is not just a dance or the music. So it's very important. But some pastors say, I have great music, many people come. Well, if they come, we have to teach them. There must be teaching. And also I want to say this about teaching. I noticed there was some teaching I was listening to some passage. It was about anointing. I cannot you know, repeat the message, but it was something like this. Anointing is great. Anointing is powerful. Anointing can bless your ministry. Anointing bless your whole life. Anointing is great. Hallelujah. Anointing, anointing. I hear all this. So what did he tell the people to do? I don't get anything what he tell the people to do. He just say, anointing is good. Anointing is great. Hallelujah, anointing. No, we're, not, we're not preaching anointing. We're preaching Jesus and God not anointing. So sometimes people preach with, you know, just shouting and without content. The content has to come from the Bible and our life digesting the Word of God. Putting it in use in our lives so that when we speak, it's the Word of God after we use it in our life, after we digest it, and then it comes out, it will help people. That's true spirituality and then we can apply to our life. So I hope everyone here will try to do that. When you learn the Word of God, it's for applying to our life so we can share with people. It's not just superficially learning. The question is, if uh, someone trying to serve God and tell people, but then the senior pastor will stop him and accuse him. Is that what it is? Okay. Now, I want to say this. Please stand now, my response to this is, my response is, my response is, we try to work with the pastor and the church. And I want to say this, 
Submission to the pastor is not equivalent to submission to God. We are submission, we submit to God, number one. We submit to the pastor when the pastor is following God. Now, I hope you don't mind me saying this. If we are in a church and the pastor doesn't care about the people, just care about money, and care about number, and doesn't care about people, we have the freedom not to serve there. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you to leave your church. I'm just saying it's very important that people have to be, they have to have the same heart to serve God together. If they don't have the same heart toward God, on the long run, we're going to have trouble. You try to help people, and then you'll be accused. It doesn't work, and then it box stop your life and ministry. So. In that case, I think the person has the freedom to go and find another church or to start his own ministry. It's up to the guidance of God. But he should first communicate with the pastor about this. Communicate with the pastor and try to find a solution. See if there's a solution. And if the pastor insists on his way and doesn't listen to the people, then it's up to the person to decide. I'm not telling you to do any action. Now, I'm just saying, that's a general rule. That's a general rule. And as a senior pastor, we have to really fear God and know that our decision affect the lives of many people. We are affecting many souls in the church and the people who come to the church. We have a very high responsibility. And God will one day ask us, why did you do that? God will ask us. So as a senior pastor, we have the responsibility to be careful about our life and what we do with people. If the pastor sees someone who is helping people and he stops him, he's stopping Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is not happy with that. So, so it's something we need to handle. But we have to be careful because sometimes there might not be this issue. Sometimes just a personal issue. We, we try to soften relational problem, soften the relationship and instead of making it more difficult. Okay. okay. Praise God. In the course of raising people to serve God, if you assign duties to them and teach them how to do it, and finally find out that they are not willing to do it, what will you do? Yes. After training them on how to do it. Okay. So the actually the first step is to ask if they are willing. So with the final people who, as, as uh, when I uh, spoke earlier, I said first the final people who really learn and who want to bless other people. And then you ask them, are you willing to come for training? And then they come for training. So they, we ask for the willingness. And in the process, if they're not willing, there could be many reasons. Maybe they're weak, maybe. Now there's some reasons that stop them. They try to overcome, but they cannot overcome. Then we try to help them. But if someone really doesn't want to serve God at all, then he should not be in the ministry team. If he doesn't want to serve God at all. So we'll find out in the process. Is the problem is that uh, you find it difficult to do it, or is it you don't want to serve God? It's two different things. But we try to change the mind that they want to serve God. But if we find people who are problematic, then problematic people actually, people who continue to sin and hurt other people, they should not be serving God. They should handle their lives first. Now weaknesses, people should overcome and they can still serve God. But if they are rejecting God, they are hurting people, people are hurt people, they should handle the problem first before they serve God. Okay. Praise the Lord. My question comes like this, or goes like this. Sometimes I want to know the best measure to be used, the methods to use, to raise up somebody to serve God. Sometimes when we use anger, anger works. When we use love, love works. I'm not going to take best nation to use. Okay. Now, to me, according to the Bible, as I said in the first day, love is always the motivation. The law is what to do. If we use the law to motivate people. What happens is, 
Then people say, I have to serve God today. I have to serve God today. But if they have the love of God, they see God is so full of love. They want to love God and follow God. If people serve God because of fear, I don't serve and then I'll go to hell. I have to serve God. Then they would just do the minimum. They just do the superficial. But if they have a heart to understand the good nature of God, the love of God, then they have a long-lasting motivation. But when they have the love of God, they should obey. So I, from the Bible, I see that Jesus did not motivate the people by beating the head and saying, you have to serve God. He did not motivate people like that. He would motivate people and say, you will be a picture of men. And you will do great things, even greater things than I do. And, and God is happy with what you do. So God uses a lot of, of, of motivation and love. But at the same time, if you pay attention to what I said, I have grace and the law together. Did you notice? I have the grace of God to motivate people. And the same time I tell people, if we sin and don't serve God, we can end up facing destruction. Have you noticed, and I said, I said those things? Then I have spoken the law at the same time. I have both. But when I sp speak the law, I don't beat on people. Unless if someone is not repentant. If someone is not repentant, then I'll say, you don't repent, you can face a severe punishment of God. You can lose everything you have. Can you afford to lose your anything you need? If you lose anything, you lose an arm, you lose a leg, a leg, you lose your health, you lose your money. Are you willing to lose this thing? You know, God can take any of this away from you. Are you afraid of God? When when people don't follow God, then I would warn them. But I warn them still in a gentle way. Only when they are very resistant and very stubborn and insist that I will. I still won't use angry words. I would just say, you have to face the judgment of God. Are you afraid of God? I think that is more powerful than saying, God will punish you today. You will die today when you go home. I just, I just, I just don't, I just don't think that um, that uh, that's the most effective way. I don't think that's the most effective way. Now, it's true, some people you yell at them and then they repent, but that's only for a short time. Some people like pastors to yell at them and then they, they ah, I'm really sorry for my sin, and they cry and they cry, and then, okay, I'll serve God. That's only for a short time. They need people to yell at them all the time. So I, I think it's, and I encourage all the preachers here, and all the teachers here, really see how loving God is. Now, I did not have enough time to talk more about the love of God, but spend more time reading the Bible and think about the love of God is wonderful nature. And when we, the more we understand the wonderful nature of God, the more we want to serve God. And when we serve Him, He remembers everything and rewards us. It's the best thing. And He can give us anything He wants to give us. So I, I prefer to encourage people. The motivation should come from the grace of God. And the want to do is from the law. Okay, now, uh, please be brief and then I try to answer the question. Okay. All right. Um, the question I want to put across is, uh, I remember you know, teaching about motivation to raise up the people we are leading. And then um, there's a particular issue. You see, in this part of the world, I don't know, it may apply in other places, but what we have seen here is what I'm talking about. Yes. Now, you, you notice that you want to, you look at the congregation, and there's somebody there who, so to say, is a money back. He is sponsoring, supporting the church financially. And it's somehow he's living a secret sin. And you want to reprove him. And you discover that some of the money, is, a lot of money is coming from him. You might want to refrain. At the point, you might decide to go against him. And his influence will take a lot of people away from that church. And he might eventually end up in another church. And the pastor will accept him without asking questions. So when such a thing comes up again, the pastor may be tempted to return the personal compromise. So he said, tell him, I don't know how to handle that.
So that is exactly, I want you to throw some light on it. Okay. Okay, your question is, so how to handle people who are sinning and yet they are giving a lot of money to the church. Yes. And I want to say this, the more we give in, we are giving the devil a foothold into the church. The church can never be good again. Once this person controls the church, and we need to talk with the person and say, I'm thankful you have a generous heart to give. It's very good. And, and the Bible says that if we have a holy heart, a sincere heart, and face our sins, and God will remember all your giving. If not, your giving will be wasted. God won't remember. So do you want to be remembered? So we guide them to understand if we have a good heart when he gives, then his giving will stay in the kingdom of God. So we approach him from his perspective to encourage him to change his life. You understand? Instead of kicking him out first, but we try to change his life. If he continue to have an affair and doesn't want to repent, then we want to keep talking to him until he repent. If he doesn't repent, then we have to say, he has to sit on the sinner's bench. And he probably won't sit there, and then he probably will leave. It's okay if some people, and then we explain to the people, this is why he has he left. Now, if you follow him, you are like him. It's up to you. Do you want to follow money, or you want, want to follow God? So, it's a teaching. If from the beginning, all the way the teaching is always to love God, obey God, follow Him, then people know who is right and who is wrong. So that's very important, the teaching is right, right from the beginning. Thank you, sir. So my question goes like this. On the side of your teaching that says caring and compassion, in a church, let's assume that I am a senior pastor there. And at the end of the year, we have Thanksgiving. And after everything, I took everything home without caring about others. Is that right? That's my question. So, Praise God. So, she's saying that the senior pastor took the money home. Yes, I have seen a year. This is a general thanksgiving of the church where people show appreciation to God for what God has done for them for the year. I need some corn with the bags of rice, you know, sometimes. This. And then at the end of the day, the pastors there, there may be a senior pastor, another one is junior, and the senior pastor says, no, I'm, a, I'm the one in church, so he takes everything home. Is it right? Those what are those things? Gifts. 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 There were some people who went to hell, hell they said that they saw pastors there who stole from the church. A pastor is easier for pastors to steal from the church than anyone else because he has access to the money. But this will take away all his ministry and also could take away his spiritual life. And he could end up in hell. So pastors be very careful to handle the money. Very careful. I have an experience of handling, you know, we gave some money to help a church in one country, but I found that the pastor refused to let another pastor supervise the money together. Then I found that there's something wrong. I have to stop giving to that pastor because he said he is the representative, so all the money should go to him. I said, I. The church, the money of the church should go to the leaders together, not just one person, but you know, all the leaders together. Okay. Praise the Lord. The church, praise the Lord. Please, sir. My question goes like this. You mentioned about tourists. 
and uh, I want to speak it in our own language. Then now, we're here now for our language. A lot of people. So I, instead of saying, nobody comes, so I'm going to stop serving. If he has a motivation, for sure he will continue with serving God. So, um, and then, now for me, for years I have worked. For years I've worked. So it's not wrong to work. But then, certain points God provide for me, and I don't have to work anymore. Okay. okay. We, we, so I won't blame anyone. I won't blame you. Praise the Lord. So everyone is short with your question. Everyone, keep it short with your question. Listen, my question is this. Uh, in our attempt to raise people in our churches, now, uh, is is discipline in the church is is it no longer uh, uh, right now or uh, should we just maybe accommodate anything that is done in the church in order to show love and uh, maybe retain people or should we maybe the senior pastor should the senior pastor stand on the word of god and the discipline any any member if a senior pastor does that, is it an act of wickedness or is it uh, maybe the pastor standing on the word of God? Okay. I need to start saying this. Discipline is a part of what we are doing. And some Christians are very unruly. And uh, I know the Bible says we should correct one another. And some people, when they are corrected, 
they, they decide to leave the church and they pass all the plan, you know. So one of the pastors will say, Pastor, why did you do this? Okay. The pastor should not be blamed. In the process of handling, disciplining someone, it's best not just the pastor alone. The first time it should be the pastor. If the person doesn't listen, then have a few leaders together handle the problem. So then the responsibility is not just on the pastor. But if someone leaves, it's not anyone's fault. Unless if the pastor handles it in a very rough way. Now, so when I talk about the way we speak, especially it will apply to pastors, don't speak in a rough way and yell at people, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And then people will run away because of the way he speaks. So we have to be careful with our wording. Church, praise the Lord. Now please, I have a question. My question is on, my question is on restitution. There are some people, restitution. There are some people, when you, when you tell them about restitution, they will tell you that there are some churches, if somebody sins, the person will come to the church in public, then stand in the, in the pulpit and tell the church is he, he or she committed. Then the church will give a discipline him or her. Then why some churches, they don't believe in coming outside and be telling the people what they're saying. They will tell you that even in the time of David, that when David said that he was in his house and prayed, and God visited, and God uh, forgave him. So I want to know the best. if it is to come outside and they say our institution and the church will discipline us or to stay in your house and pray for this. In the case of restitution, there's some churches who want the members who have heard to come publicly to, to confess. I have done this, please, pity. And then some churches will say, no, David had to ask for forgiveness in his house. So you ask for forgiveness in your closet. So which one is right? Okay. If it is a sin that is public, or there is a sin that offended people, then he should confess the sin in public. Okay. If it's a daily sin, we confess to God. But then, when the person has been excommunicated or has been disciplined, that must be a sin that is already known to the people. Then, if it's known, then he should confess perfectly. 